MC3 oh, God so good We just had our C3 supervisor, director came and had meetings yesterday And all of you, I think majority of you leaders were there In fact, we had the biggest turnout, one of the biggest turnout uh, for our pastors and leaders day And now musicians, I tell you, and all those who were serving And everything just was so excellent Praise God, let's give God a hand of praise for all of you Thank you so much church Thank you so much. Thank you, Be Seated. It's so good to be in the house of God. Thank you, musicians, singers. Can go ahead. Wow. <laughs> There's some of Dawn and Joni's relatives here. What a great, awesome wedding was that. So grand. Whew. Made me nervous when I have to make, make a speech when I saw the lights and the glitters. Wow, so, so incredible, huh? Fantastic. And she's off now for her honeymoon. Ajit and Joni. Fantastic. How are you guys? How are you? So good to see new faces and uh, some not too new anymore coming regularly. God, I've been hearing last week we had a great altar call. Some of you for the first time received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Not even at altar call. Some of you were right sitting there on a seat and God just touched you. Wow, Deborah, I want that testimony. Because I know there are others who are also struggling with this about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, with the speaking of tongues, the gift of tongues. And, uh, you know, God just supernaturally just give you the gift even though you do didn't understand or you were struggling to understand all these things about speaking in tongues. So good. I believe God is something for us. Are you, are you expecting something from God today? Yes. Amen. Are you? Yes, because he does. He's ready to give out gifts uh, to all of us. And as we come together, that, what a celebration. That's, I think we can, we can just go on celebrating and celebrating and celebrating our Lord Jesus Christ. What I'm going to say today, which I'm going on a new uh, topic, but it's really my heart is to see that our church will explode in praise for our awesome and great God. And uh, we, if you could only see in your spiritual eyes how great your God is, you won't be sitting there and just whispering or uh, you know, uh, mouthing some words, you'll be so excited. This whole place will turn upside down. The ceilings will be blown off because our God that we serve is an awesome God. Amen. Amen. All right. And you're going to see that happen as you begin to worship Him. You're going to see the manifestation of His power, the manifestation of His goodness in your life and in our meetings. That's why we need to glorify Him. Let's give Him praise again. Hallelujah. Praise Him. Praise Him! Praise Him! Hallelujah! He's worthy. He's worthy of our praise. Well, I'm going to talk about the five lies that the devil tries to tell us to get us to quit. I think many of you need this. I've been talking to some of you. Some of you are going to challenge us. And whatever challenges you're doing, facing right now, you are going to get your breakthrough the moment you grab hold of what God's going to say today. Are you ready? Now we need to understand, first of all, some very basic facts about our enemy, the devil. The thing that you need to understand about the devil in order to defeat him is that he doesn't have any authority over you. Amen? What he does is he's weave, he weaves his lies into your mind and those lies are what defeat you. The devil cannot defeat you, but his lies can. See that? How can we take authority over his lies? I'm going to give you three facts. Are you ready? The first one. Note, we don't need to defeat the devil. Did you hear that? We don't need to fight him. He's already defeated. Jesus won it all. He sung just now the song. Amen? Come on. Jesus has won it all. On the cross, he's defeated. We simply need to defeat his lies. How do we defeat his lies? Through God's truth. Very simple, with the truth of God. If the truth makes me free, if the truth sets us free, then lie makes you a prisoner. Lie imprisons you. Now, we are imprisoned to our pain. We are imprisoned to our past. 
We are in prison to our limitations. We are in prison to our fears. I talked a lot about how God wants to break us out of our smallness, our defeated and limitation. And we're going to continue with this because that's what God wants to do. He wants to raise us up, enlarge us as our theme is for this year. And so we need to get that true that He is defeated. All we need is the Word of God. That's what you're doing when you come week after week. Week after week, you are getting the Word of God that's going to dispel the lies of the devil, exposes the lie of the devil, and the devil, all those lies that put you in bondage will be broken today as you receive the Word of God. Amen? Just like light. Light does not have to fight with darkness. Have you ever seen light fighting with darkness, pushing, pushing, pushing the darkness out of the room? You ever see that? Never. All you do is just switch on the light, turn on the light, and the darkness flee. There's no fight. There's no struggle. In the same way, when we know the truth, the truth is going to set us free and dispel, expose and dispel the lies, and the truth will set us free completely. That's what we need to do. Amen? Now, the second important understanding of what Jesus has done for us and what the devil is doing is this, the second point. Jesus cannot defeat your wrong thinking. You have to be responsible for your own thinking. No one can control, can control your thinking except yourself. Jesus cannot go into your mind and try to dismantle the wrong thinking in your head that is inside. All right, You have to renew your mind. You have to understand the word. Not just know the word, understand the word, believe the word, what, declare the word, preach the word, pray the word. That's your mighty weapon that you have. Not just, oh, yes, I have a Bible, a big Bible that I put in my house that's collecting dust. But you need a word of God that's like a two-edged sword in your mouth. And you could declare it. In fact, what I preach, what I see, the manifestation of the miraculous power and presence of God, you can do the same thing. You can preach. Well, we can't, everybody can come up here and start preaching. But you can preach right where you are, at home, in your private room. All right, preach the word, declare the word, and you're going to see the lies of the devil that's over your life broken because God's word will set you free. God's word will produce right thinking in your mind. Amen? But you have to choose. I, thought, I, I, I think I thought about uh, how important it is, the, the reality that you want uh, to happen in your life. You have to choose. You have to make decisions. You have to choose the way of thinking you're going to have or the, how the, to adopt the mindsets that you're going to live by. All right? So now, the third fact that you need to remember is Satan is a liar. The devil is a liar. He's the father of lies from the beginning of time. Satan has operated in lies. Look, right at the beginning. God told Adam and Eve, what did God say? Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The day you eat, you shall surely die. And what does the devil comes along and say? No, you shall not die. The devil always tries to contradict what God says, and he's always trying to get you to believe what he tells you, contrary to what God says. God says. So the devil is a liar and he uses lies to accomplish what he wants in you. Three things that he's going to do. Do you remember John 10.10? 10? Can you remember what John 10.10 10 says? The thief does not come except to steal, kill, and to destroy. Jesus said, I've come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So the devil has threefold plans. And what's his plan? To steal, Kill and destroy. How does he do that? Absolutely. Through lies. Through lies. That's all. That's all he has. The power. If you believe his lies, then you're defeated by him. John 8, 44 says he's always speaking lies. He will whisper anything into your ears, whatever he wants to try to control you. He will tell you, you're a failure. You're a loser. You're born with the wrong color. You're born into the wrong family. You don't have enough education. You don't have enough money. You don't have enough success. You're not good enough. 
You're never going to be good enough. You make too many mistakes. You're far too gone. You're far too gone. See, th- those are the things he's going to whisper. And if you listen to th- these lies, these lies are going to imprison you. See that? So what are we going to do about it? Huh? Mark chapter 3 verse 27. I like this verse. says, No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first what? Binds the strong man. Yes? Then he will plunder his house. Okay, sometimes people read this verse and like, what's this talking about? The strong man here is talking about the devil. First, we have to find the devil or the strong man and where he is and then we need to plunder his house. But what this means, this verse really means is that the strong man, the devil has built his house. Where? Where? In Chowkit? Huh? In Pataling Street? Where is he building his house? In all our minds, here, in our head, it's a wall of lies. Walls are either built to what? Uh, to keep you in, uh, imprison you, yeah, or to protect you, right? These walls that the enemy has built are lies. And walls are also built on truth. Now, Satan has built a war, wall of lies over our minds and imprison us. And it causes you to retreat back. Every time you hit the wall, you retreat. You, it's like you get shocked and you go back, retreat into your limitations, into your fears of what confines you, what defines you. And today, that's what we're going to do. We're going to expose those lies. All right? And once we do that, you know, we know what he has done to us. He has stolen all our stuff from us. You know, what are things he has stolen from you, right? Loads of things that are stolen from you. Your time, your money, your talents, your opportunities, your health, your finances, your relationships, your families. He has stolen this whole lot of stuff from you. And what we do is when we find where the strong man is, we're going to bind him and only then we can plunder his house. We're going to continue on this. I feel like I want to continue on this. And how are we going to plunder yeah. Once we bind him, we're going to plunder and get back all our stuff that he has stolen from us. But the first thing that we need to do, or the first objective we need to have is what? Find out where the strongholds are. Then we can bind that stronghold, uh, strong man, and then only can we be set free and to go in and take back what belongs to us. You see that? So, before we can bind the strong man, let's identify the strongholds that he has over our lives. And what are strongholds? Let me explain now, okay? Let me do a bit of teaching. When we, we talk about strongholds, what strongholds? Stronghold in the Bible is a military fort or prison. It either built to protect you from within or to imprison you what's inside. So, we're supposed to pull down that stronghold that imprisons us and then build up a stronghold that's going to protect us. That's a stronghold. A stronghold is an incorrect pattern of thinking which has been molded into our mindset. It's already set in our mind. So it affects your emotions. It affects your responses. It affects the decisions that you make. It's not just a thought. They just enter into your mind once, all right? It's more than that. The mind, your mind is already fixed on a certain way of thinking. You believe that you're a loser, and so you feel rejected, and you feel that nobody loves you, nobody cares about you. This is always in your heart. No matter where you go, you feel such a loneliness. You feel like you are, you're a lost child. Peter Pan, lost boy. But somehow, the enemy has weaved that into your mind, and it's a stronghold inside of you. Even in a relationship, you have friends, and you still feel lonely, and you feel like, I can't open myself to anybody because I'm not sure people can love me or accept me for who I am. And you're a very lonely person. You feel like you're a loser. What is a mindset? Let me explain this. A mindset is a thermom- uh, sorry, a thermostat. Now, you set the thermostat at a certain temperature, right? And what happens is, once you set it, everything elevates to that temperature that you have set. If you set at 16 degrees, what happens is that? Uh, everything, whether it's hot or cold, it, the room is, everything will rise to that temperature that you have set. 
Yes or no? This is what the mindset is. A mindset is when you set a certain temperature and then you keep it there. You don't just change it and then set it again, change it and set it again. Once you set it, all the other circumstances in your life eventually will rise to the level of your mindset. Do you understand that? So a mindset is really not just a mental, but it's a spiritual thermostat. No, many people have a mindset of defeat, a mindset of shame. And so you keep setting your mind on defeat and shame and everything reflects, your life begins to reflect that temperature of defeat and shame. Or you can set your mind on the things of God. And what happens is when you begin to set your mind on the things of God, everything in your life will create peace. Because Isaiah 26 verse 3, you all know the verse it says, He will keep you in perfect peace. How do you have perfect peace? How? Whose mind is stayed on you. Whose mind is stayed on him, on God. That means your mind is set on him because you trust in him. That's how <laughs> your mind is set. You have to have a mindset. Colossians 3 verse 1. Did you hear? Here it says, since we have been raised with Christ, now set your mind on things above where Christ is. That's where you are seated. Every day you are seated with Christ. <laughs> Hallelujah. Aren't you glad? Doesn't matter how you feel, you are there. Your position is secure there. You're seated with Christ at the right hand of God. Okay. Now Philippians 4 verse 8 says another Beautiful verse says here, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is of excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So your mind, if it's dwelling on whatever is good, then good is going to happen in your life. Did you hear that? As your mind is dwelling on Things that are lovely, lovely stuff is going to manifest in your life. Whatever your mind sets on. That's why the mind, the Bible says in Romans uh, 5 verse 8 says, The mind sets on the flesh is death. But the mind sets on the spirit is life and peace. So you want your mind to be set on the spirit, right? Amen? Okay? So we have to decide. What are we going to allow our mind to set on? The kingdom of God is what? Tell me. Righteousness. Peace and joy. That's the kingdom of God that I've got to set my mind on. So when the devil tries to get me to focus on my weakness, focus on my failures, I choose to set my mind on my righteousness in Christ. Amen. When the devil tries to get me to focus on how upset I am, how, uh, uh, how angry I am or whatever, I'm going to set my mind on peace. And when the enemy tries to make you depressed and sad, what are you going to set your mind on? I'm going to set my mind on joy. So you've got to decide. You've got to choose to set your mind on the things of God. Okay. It's very easy right now while we're in church, right? To set our mind on the kingdom of God, righteousness, peace, and joy. Because you're surrounded by people who love you, people who care for you. And you are here. You receive the word of God and the word of God. And, obey. and uh, every time when you come into the presence of God and uh, hear the word of God, it's like you're taking a spiritual bath. When you feel so fresh after you have taken a bath, right? How many of us feel like that? Oh, I feel so good. Huh? When you're all yucky and sticky and all that. Then you get a bath, you feel so refreshed. The same way when you come to church, you feel like that. After you leave this service, you feel, I'm so refreshed. I'm so, I feel so wonderful. I feel like I'm on top there. I'm set my mind on the things of God. Then come Monday. Then come Monday. And life hits you hard. <laughs> And you don't have anybody around you to encourage you, all right? You don't have the musicians here singing and encouraging you in worshipping. What do you do? You've got to set your mind that I'm the head and not the tail, even if you feel like you are the tail. We do feel like that sometimes, right? All right, we have to set our mind that we are healed. By His stripes, I'm healed. Even though you feel the aches and the pains. All of us older people, even younger people have aches and pains nowadays. All right? We've got to set our minds on the word of God, what he has to say about us, that we are more than conquerors to Christ. Even though you feel defeated sometimes, 
your emotions. Like I said, that's where the, uh, that's where the enemy can play tricks with you. Okay? If you're going to live your life according to your emotions, I tell you, you'll be a yo-yo, up, down, up, down. Huh? Mad next minute, they're happy next minute, and you are upset the next minute. We've got to set our mind on the things of God. Okay, let me give you another verse. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3. Read here, it says, Consider him who endures such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Oh, I need another verse actually. Can you quickly? This is what? King James, is it? NIV. Can you get into... Uh, King James. Is this King James? No, I think it's NIV. Get me into New King James. New King James. Is that New King James? Uh oh. <laughs> I don't know what. Okay. Don't worry about it. Okay. Now, the heart and the mind is always interchangeable. Okay. Here it says, lest you be weary and faint in your mind. This is a translation that says, Lest you be weary and faint in your mind. Okay, I just wanted to you to see that. That when t- where do you feel faint and want to give up? Did it say it's in your body? Come on now, response. No? Did it say it's in your health? No? <laughs> what does it say? It says in, it's in your mind. It's in your mind. Here. In your mind where you want to give up. It's in your thought life where we give up. When you faint here, you faint everywhere. See that? Nobody has a t- hard time with exercise, honestly, physically. Okay? It's a mental thing. <laughs> your body is able to walk or tread walk or whatever, walk four kilometers an hour, whatever. Yes? Or you can actually carry weights. I mean, my daughter is really tiny, small, uh, the one that's in Australia, and she carries like huge weights. I'm shocked how on earth you can carry such heavy weights. And she's trained to do that, all right? With proper training, you're able to do that. But somehow, our minds would tell us, no, you can't. It's too difficult. It's too long. You have, you know, oh, you're in pain. It's our mind. It causes us to stop our mind. Our body can endure much. And do as much in life. But our mind will tell us we can't do it. Yes? It's our mind that convinces us to stop, to quit. <laughs> so when we become mentally weak, that's where we become physically weak. Our mind is where the battle is. Hello? That's where the battle is. That's where our, the enemy fights. Our mind is where we faint and give up. See that? You can actually sit in church for three hours. Hmm. Very quiet now. No, I won't keep you for three hours, sorry. Yeah, now we're trying to keep our service even shorter, one and a half hours, all right? But you can actually want to stay in church for three hours, won't you? Huh? Can you or cannot? But then in your mind, if I keep you for three hours, your mind will start getting weary and uh, you're getting mad at me and say, Pastor, why are you so long? Why is this going on, on and on and on and on? (laughs) You get mad with me, right? You won't be happy because you're thinking of your lunch. <laughs> you're thinking of going home to watch your movie. You're going home to have a nap. Or you're going home to... Oh, you're all not like that. Cruel. Yes or not? No, yeah? You can just stay in the service. No, some of you are going to get mad with me. Why? Because your mind says, I, I can't take it. It's too long. All right? But then when we go for a movie, oh, and the movie is three hours. I mean, we won't even go to the bathroom, right? We just sit like... <laughs> okay, watching intensely for three hours. We could take that three hours. Your, your mind tells you, I cannot miss it. I cannot take a, even a leak. But in church, you come to church, suddenly you got weak bladder. Every three minutes, you got to rush to the bathroom, yeah? You're so restless. And to, thank God, we only got one bathroom here. So not everybody is, half the people are inside. <laughs> Taking a break. All right, so... What I'm saying is really in your mind yeah, that, that makes you weak. So whatever exercise that you're going on, I'm telling you quite a number of us are going to keep fit. Praise God. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when you feel like your body can't take it anymore, anymore remember, it's a mind thing. 
as a mental strength that is where the enemy tries to attack us. Okay, so there are five lies. I'm going to talk about how the devil tries to get us to quit. Taken from the passage of Nehemiah chapter 4, we're going to look into the book of Nehemiah. Uh, how the children of Israel here has been taken captives by the Babylonian nation. And a Babylonian empire is in control of the Jewish people here. And then God spoke to Nehemiah and said to, that his people are in captivity for too long now. And he said, Nehemiah, I want you to tell the people, I want to tell the Jewish people, to go back to Ju Jerusalem. I want them to build the walls of Jerusalem again that was burned down and torn down. Okay? And I want you to protect you within those walls. And so we understand that walls are strong, is a stronghold, correct or not? A, a stronghold that's used to either imprison people that's within or to protect these people that's within. So now, God wants us to build a stronghold. Just as God wanted Nehemiah to tell the people to build the wall, the stronghold, uh, all right, by putting brick upon brick upon brick to build up a wall of defense against the devil. And that's what we're doing today. We're going to rebuild our lives and we're going to rebuild our lives with bricks after brick after brick of God's word. And look at Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 1. What does it say here? When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews. Sanballat represents the devil, our enemy, his plans for our lives. Now Satan hears that you are attending C3 church now. Huh. He's not very happy. He's been mad. He's... Because you're receiving teaching after teaching, and every teaching that you receive is like a brick that you receive from God, and you're building your life instead of, you know, you're tearing down your old walls of lies that the enemy has put, uh, erected around you, and you are building your walls of God's truth, all right? And that what's happened is God told Nehemiah, I want you to get the people to start building their walls, start building their lives, and Satan got so furious. I'm telling you, devil is not happy. The devil will not be happy when you start coming to church, when you start bringing your people to church and you're coming week after week after week. You're receiving the teaching of God's word and the word of God's going to build your life. He doesn't want you to pray. He doesn't want you to uh, keep, uh, uh, you know, worshiping God. He doesn't want you to keep coming to church. But you are doing it because you know that as you get those bricks, as you keep building your walls, you're going to fence him out. It's going to be a defense against the enemy. Amen. <laughs> so, what does, what's the strategy of the devil here? In verse 2, look at what he, he tries to do. Verse 2, this is what Sanballat said. In the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said this. What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burn as they are? What is Sambalat trying to do? He's questioning, just like Satan. Always question God's word. Every time you receive the word of God, he comes to question, comes to challenge the word of God. Five questions that I'm going to talk about. These five questions are very important. Of how you're going to defeat, expose the lies of the enemy. Uh -huh. These five questions, number one. You ready? Number one, <laughs> these lies that he throw at you is to get you to quit believing God, all right? To, to get uh, Nehemiah's people to get discouraged and stop building the walls. And what are, what are the five lies? Okay, listen, the first lie here is, who are these feeble Jews? Notice the word feeble. So that means what he's trying to say to you is that you don't have the strength you don't have what it takes to make it. You don't have what it takes to live a Christian life. He will lie to you and tell you, you can never be a strong Christian like so and so. Yeah? No way. You are too weak. He keeps telling you, you're not strong enough. You're too weak. Has he lied that to you? Definitely. Many times. Hmm? What are we going to do? How do we dispel those lies? With the word of God. So we... Bring out the word. Ephesians 6 verse 10 says what? Finally, be, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. So I'm not weak. You defeat His lies by declaring the word that says, I'm not weak, I'm strong in the might of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what you declare. 1 John 4 4 says what? The greater is... 
the one that's in you than he that's in the world. You declare the word again. Then you declare Philippians 4, 13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. You declare the word again. Repeatedly, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 29 to 31 says, He gives strength to the weary and increase the power of the weak. Even the youth grows tired and weary. The young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in God will renew their strength. Amen. Come on. Hallelujah. You have the word. I've just given you four scriptures. Is that four scriptures? Four scriptures here that you can defeat the devil with. You've got to defeat the devil with the truth of God's word. You've got to start, stop believing and listening to his lies and start speaking the word of God. I'm telling you, one of the things that the, uh, Pastor Anthony and Pastor Jake talked about and said, one of the things that's going to cause the church to rise up is that we will all start preaching the word. We all start declaring the word. Get a whole bunch of scriptures back and declare the word every morning when you pray. Declare the word of God. Don't just say some nice prayers and, you know, and, and feel that it's going to keep you throughout the day. You declare the word. You keep speaking the word. As you keep speaking the word of God, the word of God is going to defeat the lies of the enemy. That's in your mind. The stronghold is going to come down. All right. Now, lie number two now. Let's look. What's he saying here? Are they going to restore it for themselves? You know, I can hear the sarcasm here. Are they really going to restore it for themselves? <laughs> In other words, he's saying, you know, you're, you're trying to do it for your name. Your, what, he, what it means from this scripture is that you're praying for yourself. You're being selfish. You're being greedy. You've got the wrong motives for what you are praying for. Has he told you that lately? Huh? <laughs> and you will dispel that with Genesis 12 verse 2 says, God's word says, in fact, it's God's idea. He says what? I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. God said that. God wants to bless you and make you a great nation. And he wants you to give, have a great name. Amen. So it's not my idea. Why do I want more? It's because I'm greedy and I'm selfish. No, I want more because I want to be a blessing. I want to give more to the kingdom of God. I want more so that I can do more for God. All right. Jesus has died to pay for our sins, pay for our salvation, pay for our healing, pay for our deliverance. So why should I settle for what, this, what God's given to me? Why should I? So ask for more. Dare to ask for more. I know that God is, you know, not limited you know, in our understanding, like today, if I'm going to bring a box of pizza here. Pizza has how many pieces? Eight pieces, right? <sighs> can I share with all of you? No, only eight people can come out and each have a piece, right? After that, there's no more left for any of you. Sometimes we have this mentality. We think that, oh, somebody is blessed. My goodness, that person's blessed. This person's blessed. That person's blessed. What, what about me? It's like there's a shortage with God. That if God blesses these people, there's... There, He's going to run out of blessing. Is that, is that true? No way. God is the owner of the pizza factory. Amen. He's got all the dough. He's got all the pepperoni. He's got all the mozzarella, cheese, everything. And he's got your gifts, everything, your blessing in your name, labor, that nobody can steal from you. And if you believe that, and you not get frightened and say, oh, I, I don't know why everybody's being blessed except me. Why? No, you haven't claimed it yet. You haven't claimed it yet. It's there waiting for you with your name on it. Praise God. Aren't you excited? <laughs> so when we look like sometimes even with uh, us, like we look at other churches, well, what they have this, oh, what that. and uh, even as pastors, we are feeling like, insecure. Why, why are we not having all these things that's happening? Oh, God said, you've got your inheritance. Have you, it's your birthright. You have what you have. You know, you claim and you go after the things that you have. And definitely who is the one that's holding it? God's not holding it back from you. The enemy has built strongholds in your mind and kept you a prisoner. Until you bind him and uh, until you bind him, only then you can plunder his house and take back everything that is yours. Amen. Come on, am I the only one that's excited here? <laughs> 
I, I mean, I came away, the enemy wants to lie and make me depressed and make me upset and, and think, oh, you know, what's happening? You know, why aren't we getting this? And one, why is the delay of this? And why is the de delay of that? And a word of God just came up so clearly that God, God saying, it's yours. You got to find this. You got to find a strong, stronghold that's in your mind that's holding back what is really yours. All the stuff that the enemy has stolen from you, you're going to take it back from him. In the name of Jesus, I'm speaking to you, all of you, all of us, going to take back everything that's rightfully ours. All right? The moment we pull down those strongholds, destroy those strongholds. Huh, hallelujah. We're going to take back what is ours. Praise God. I see that happening right now. And many of you have to get that revelation that it's not like, oh, I'm shortchanged. Why is my life like that? I'm so unlucky. Why is life so unfair? You realize that it's right there with you. The enemy has taken it from you. You need to take it back from him. Amen. Okay, the line number three that we're going to go. Can they truly offer sacrifices? What the devil is saying is that you can't worship God. What he's saying is you're not worthy to worship God. Your worship isn't doing any good. The devil doesn't want you to worship God. I want you to see how powerful worship is. The devil will tell you, you don't need to go to church early. Ah, Mr. Worship, it's okay. Why, why do you need to worship for? Look at the sin. Look at the addiction. <laughs> you're being a hypocrite, aren't you? Huh? Try to worship God on Sunday. And look how you live on... What you did on Thursday, what you did on Friday, in fact, look what you did. You just cursed before you came to church. Ooh. And you say, yeah, I did. <laughs> and you're you going to worship? Is, is it going to, are you worthy to worship? In fact, stand there and worship. Don't be a hypocrite. Well, we worship God not because we're worthy. We worship Him because He's worthy. Amen. Don't get it wrong. Worship is not accomplishing anything for you. That's what the devil will tell you. What good is it anyway? But you need to ask Paul and Silas that. What good is their worship anyway? When they worship, the walls start to shake, the floors start to shake, the doors flew open, the chains around their hand and their feet were broken. What good is worship to them? <laughs> ask Jehoshaphat. We all hear the story of Jehoshaphat, how he sent his army, and what's his army? It's a... It's a uh, group of men and women who are going to praise God, worship God. And look what happened as they were praising God and worshiping God. The enemy is defeated. They were killing each other. They're killing themselves. And when they went into the camp, the enemy is already destroyed. And the goods were all there. What did they do? Prior to them gathering all the goods and the spoils, what were they doing? Worshipping. Worshipping. That is what happened. They got back the spoils. They possessed all the goods. So, don't tell me that worship is not important. Ask Abraham about how good his worship is. How he, when he took his son Isaac and went up to Mount Moriah to offer his son, just when he was about to kill his son, God said, stop, and then showed a lamb, a ram that was caught in a bush. He took that ram and he sacrificed it to God. God is trying to say it was a foreshadow of what... What Jesus is going to do, he's going to come to die for our sins, the sins of the whole world. Abraham's worship moved God to send his son to die for it on, on behalf of the whole world. That's what worship has done. So we need to see what worship has done. Your worship is so powerful. I'm telling you, you're not here to just hear the word. When you come to worship God, I tell half the things what God wants to do for you is already accomplished. I'm telling you that. <laughs> Half the battle that you want to fight is already done. <laughs> Here, Psalms 149 verse 5 to 9 says, another verse, can we read that? It says, let the saints be joyful in glory. This, let them sing, what, softly? No, it says sing. Say, come on. Aloud on the beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth. And a two-edged sword in their hands. That's what you do when you open your mouth and sing aloud. It's like two-edged sword that's in your hand. And what are you doing with the hand, with the, the sword of God? You, you execute vengeance on the nations, you punishment on the people, to bind the kings with chains and the nobles with fetters of iron, to execute on them the written judgment. This honor have all his saints. Praise the Lord. So says, 
very clearly here that worships, what happened to worship? In worship, God breaks every chain that the enemy has put over your arms and over your feet. Judgment was rendered to them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay. Another one that's very important if you think of keeping your children at home because it's, they're too troublesome to, to bring them to church. This is what the verse of God says. Psalms 8 verse 2 says what? Through the praise of children and infants, even babies, it says, you have established a stronghold against your enemies. To what? To what? Shout it out. What's the word? To silence. Come on, no wonder you're not... Why are you going ahead of me? That's not yet. Go back. Oh, you don't have the verse. No wonder. To silence the fool and the avenger. So what he's saying here is that when you worship God, you are silencing the devil. Praise God. Amen. You are silencing the enemy because he knows your praise is going to silence him. So he doesn't want you to praise God. He doesn't want you to open your mouth to worship because he knows that when you start praising, you're going to silence. You're going to shut him up. <laughs> That's what I need to do. Habakkuk 3 verse 17 to 18. Another verse I want you to understand. This is, I want to just labor on this lie, okay? And this is so important that you understand how powerful your worship is. Huh? Some of you say, I can't even sing. Nobody in my family can sing. The only, the only singer that I have is a it's a sewing machine. <laughs> but it doesn't matter if you can't carry a tune. It doesn't matter if you can't sing. You need to open your mouth, even if you sing out of tune, because there's power that's released from your mouth as you sing. All right. <laughs> yeah, some of you are like, I, I don't want to sing. I don't want to embarrass myself with people at the side that's going to hear me sing out of tune. Who cares? When we sing together, you know, we all harmonize and it sounds so good. Do you know that? So here is another thing that says, when you're supposed to sing, though the fig tree does not bud and there was no grapes or no vines, though the olive crop fails and the field produced no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in my God. Amen. Come on. Hallelujah. What he's saying is that, though there are no fruit yet, I will rejoice. Though there's no harvest yet, I will rejoice. Though I've not seen my healing manifest yet, I will rejoice. Amen. Though I don't see my marriage have to break through yet, what do you do? I will rejoice. Though I haven't found my husband yet, come on you, though I haven't found my wife yet, Come on, you can say better than that. Though I haven't paid up all my bills yet. Oh, my. I will rejoice in the Lord. Amen. And this is what releases the power of God, all right, into your life. You got to start praising God. The Bible says very clearly. James says, consider it pure joy when you're going through the trials. Not after you have the victory. Then consider it pure joy when you are going through the trial. When you are going through it. That's when you are to be joyful in God. Amen. That's tough, right? But that's what we're going to do. That's what we're going to set our minds on the victory before we see it. Alright? Okay, now line number three now. It says here. Will they finish it in a day? Try to sound as sarcastic as possible. Huh? Does it sound good? The devil is saying, do you think you can finish it in a day? You're not going to make it. You're not going to achieve anything. You may start well, but you're not going to finish it. No, 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 no. My God say he's faithful. He started this and he will also finish it. Amen. He's the author and finisher of my faith. It's not just me. It's God who is faithful to his word. That's what we need to do. We need to cancel the lie of the enemy. Expose the lie of the enemy and dispel it with the truth of God's word. Okay, final. Is it final? Lie number five. Oh, just now was lie number four. Right? Did I skip some liars? Oh, yeah. That's lie number four. Now, lie number five. Oh, this is good. Can they revive the stones from the dusty rubbles? Even the burnt ones? Ooh, what's this lie about? What this lie is saying that 
your life is just too ruined, it's too late, it's too burnt. You are too burnt. You have blown it big time. You, you, you've gone too far. You are divorced. You have committed adultery. You have cheated. You have lied. You have done all these in, bad things in the life. You're not going to see any good in your life. It's too late for you. Really? Is it too late for you? I'm asking some of you here, seated here, that has believed that lie about what the devil has said to you. Was it too late for the thief on the cross? Was it too late for him? No. When he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what did Jesus say? Truly, I say to you, today, you will be with me in paradise. Is it too late? No, it's not too late. Was it too late for Abraham when he was 99 years old, when God promised him 24 years earlier that he was going to give him a son, Isaac, through his wife, Sarah? Was it too late? Was it too late for Sarah, 90 years old? She is past the childbearing age. Was it too late for her? God can touch her, move her, and open her womb? Was that too late? No. <laughs> Come on, let's hear a louder, more aggressive no. Okay. Was, a, was Rahab too burnt? <laughs> she was a prostitute. And yet she helped the spies, the Jewish spies, hit them and protected them. And because of that, God said, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to bless you. And she became, she ended in a book of halls of fame, imagine. Rahab, a woman of faith for what she has done. Changed the whole history of, his, of her life. Her, she, her life just took a turn. Was it too late for her too? Was her life too messed up? No. Look at all the Bible heroes in there, what their lives is. Because God's able to bring beauty out of the ashes of your life. If you will cancel all those lies that the enemy has been speaking to you time and again with the truth of God's word, today you are going to plunder his house. Hallelujah. You're going to plunder and get back everything he has stolen from you. Hallelujah. We're going to see everything that rightfully ours being released back to us again. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Really, really, really ready to do that. That spiritual warfare, I'm telling you, that's powerful, right? Spiritual warfare is not you trying so hard to fight the devil, scream and shout and pray longer, pray harder, get more people to get along to do. You start praising the Lord, I'm telling you. You start opening your mouth and shout and sing and declare the word of God and rejoice. And that will send the devil into a fit. He will be mad. He will think, what's wrong? I thought I'm going to get him, get this whole bunch of people to be complaining, to be depressed, to be angry. But they're singing, they're dancing, they're rejoicing. Because your stuff is going to be released to you. Hallelujah. As you sing and declare the praises of God. Are you ready to sing and praise God today? That's when the presence of God, like, let me tell you, when you sing and praise God, I'm telling you the presence of God, no, the devil flees. Like I said, you turn on the light, the devil has to flee. You don't even have to do anything. You don't have to you move even a muscle. Just open your mouth and praise Him. Hallelujah. Are we ready to do that? Are we really, really ready to do that? Come on, musicians. Come up right now. Come on. We're going to praise God together. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Church, I need you to do that. I want to tell you how important it is. Every one of you, every Sunday, come early. Come on time. Get ready to worship God. Get ready for an explosion of worship right here. Because I see God's going to do fantastic. I, I'm telling you, we're going to see strongholds come down from, in the lives of people that's going to come in. We're, we're beginning to see that happen. Okay, week after week where people coming, responding to God. And God's doing, God's doing something. God's rebuilding your life. God's rebuilding your life. Your life is in ruins. Like the walls of Jerusalem, it was burnt to the ground, broken down. Enemy has come in and taken every single thing from you, and that's how you feel. The enemy has robbed you of your finances, robbed you of your family, robbed you of opportunities, robbed you of relationships, robbed you of your peace of mind, robbed you of your joy. But today's, I'm going to take back everything. I'm not going to allow my... 
I'm not going to allow the enemy to take rob from me ever again. I'm going to build my walls back up with God's brick after brick of God's truth. Are you ready? Yes, that's what we're going to do. We're going to start by worshipping God now, right? Everybody across the room, all right? We're going to worship God. And as we're going to worship God, I want you to sing with all your heart. And as we're going to sing, I'm, I'm going to, after that, ask you, every single one of you, something's going to happen supernaturally. The Spirit of God's going to descend upon us in a powerful way as we begin to shout the praises of God. And I want to declare to you right now, amen. Music, go, go ahead. Music, we are, wow. Come on, do it again. Wow, do it again. Whew. Call to worship. Are you ready? I want you to shout and sing and rejoice like never before. Hallelujah. Shout it out and sing with all of your heart.
God is risen. He is alive. He won the victory. He reigns on high. Our God is risen. He is alive. He won the victory. He reigns on high.
nothing less than best what God has for you. And if, you, if the enemy has built the walls of lies in your life, today we're going to tear it down. I want you to come right now. Right now. Come to the altar. Step it out. And the Holy Spirit is going to break down everything that the enemy has strongholds that in your mind, that's in your life. In the name of Jesus today, we're going to see those strongholds broken. Amen. Broken. The walls the enemy has built broken. The walls that imprison you to be removed, to be broken, so that you be set free. Hallelujah. Free to be all that God's called you to be. Free to do all that God's called you to do. Free to have all that God has called you to have. Amen. All right. So right now, right now, hallelujah. This music continue to pray. As we continue to pray, I want you to come right to the front now. Leaders, come right to the front right now. You want something broken over your life. You want the walls to come down. Today, the walls are going to come tumbling down. Come tumbling down. Walls of lies are going to come tumbling down. Come on, leaders, come. Come to the front. And we're going to pray. For, we're going to stand in prayer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to see victory for all these people that come forward. Hallelujah. Freedom. Freedom. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many of you can sense the anointing of God in this place as you worship and shout? Oh, the enemy is fleeing before you. The enemy is fleeing before you as you submit to God, as you come forward for prayer. You're saying, I'm submitting myself to you, oh God. And the enemy is fleeing. The enemy runs. Come on. Hallelujah. The enemy runs. Bring every lie. Come on. Go ahead and stop praying. We break every line. Leaders, come pray. Come pray. Hallelujah. Just turn around and pray for them. We break every line of the enemy over this line. We break every line. Strongholds. Lies to be broken over the line. Broken over the line. We break every line. Oh, of deception. Break every stronghold.
Just now, can you feel the presence of God, the anointing of God in this house? Yeah. It's going to double, it's going to be triple. We're going to see many, many miracles, signs, wonders following. I'm telling you, the key, the secret is the praise. Let's get serious about praising God.